It's almost five past ten, so I think it's good time to start already and say hello everyone and welcome to the second online seminar of the training for international staff to support high quality student mobility. My name is Victoria Tersieva. I'm a project coordinator at the European University Foundation and I will be also your host today. I'm very delighted that uh, you're so many again for this uh, seminar as, uh, as the last week. So I won't take too long for the introduction because I'm sure that you're excited about the two sessions that uh, will follow today. I will just, before we start, share with you again um, and remind you that uh, the session is recorded and uh, you can visit uh, the video on our website of the FEST project. You have a Q&A where you can write your questions and uh, this time we will answer them after each presentation. And you also have the chat box where you can share general comments and um, question also to uh, discuss with uh, the other attendees. So what uh, will happen today? We have two presentations. One is from Beate Körner from the German Academic Exchange Service uh, Day, Day who will talk about the Erasmus Plus project management in the current circumstances. And then we have Frederick de Decker from Ghent University, who is also sharing a very relevant uh, presentation on change management and some interesting tools and techniques on how to deal with the change. And um, now I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Christina Bille, the coordinator of the Project Fest to share some insights from the last session. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, welcome from my side as well to all of you. And um, I'm really happy that in spite of the um, uh, approaching holidays and uh, I expect a lot of work that's still waiting on your desks uh, to finish before you go into your well-deserved holiday season, you still take the time to attend this meeting. Um, last time, most of you will have participated. We had uh, an introductory session and we had Adessa from ESN who presented the student's perspective on mobility and especially the student experience going through the processes that we implement at our offices. And one aspect was, of course, to identify what needs we have to meet, uh, how to uh, involve students actively and opportunities for closer cooperation uh, between IROs and the student communities. Um, then we had an, a presentation from Ann from uh, University of Ghent uh, who presented the very specialized knowledge that we have in Erasmus uh, in her presentation on the Erasmus language. And uh, the feedback was very positive there as well. And we noticed that Apparently, we do have a lot of knowledge that we don't actually maybe perceive as such and that we use in our daily work and use for communication in the different work contexts. Um, then else from Hanse University um, presented our framework for Erasmus staff competences um, and uh, showed how to use this tool to identify relevant competences to assess yourself and your position at your institution, and of course, to enhance the visibility of your tasks and competences. And here on the slide that Victoria is showing, um, we have some of the feedback that you uh, forwarded to us uh, on the seminar and what you've taken from the seminar. And you can discover some of the aspects I've mentioned as well here. Um, so a lot was on communication, a lot was on knowledge as well in, for different aspects of your work. And today we want to follow up on this, of course. You can change the slide, thank you. Um, and um, we had asked in the beginning of the last training, your expectations for the training. Um, and these are the top priority uh, um, topics that you or expectations that you selected and uh, you see number one was to learn how to adapt better to new changing work requirements. This is the topic of course of today's session and uh, we will go into some detail on how to adapt uh, to change, how to adapt to crisis or how to deal with it, uh, to face challenges in your daily work. Uh, other aspects were improve my communication skills to reach my target groups 
this was of course one aspect we discussed uh, with Adessa and we will follow up on this uh, in the sessions early next year but of course communication and project management will be one aspect that we will um, I guess um, discuss a bit today as well and then learn how to handle stress and crisis situations and project management so uh, you see we try to adapt to your wishes uh, completely and have designed the session today to really um, help you with the current issues with the current challenges in your work um, and for the next slide victoria um, just to remind you a bit as well um, of elements that you identified you named as relevant in defining the quality of student mobility you know of course, this refers back to the quality and the requirements of your work as well. Uh, just to remind you a bit of the diversity of issues that we are dealing with in our work uh, in the Erasmus program and in international programs in general. Um, and you can discover here a number of topics that we have mentioned and the, that we will be working on, like communication in various contexts and uh, strategies, support, support of target groups, support of colleagues, um, integration, um, transparency. This was an issue um, and will be an issue as well, for example, in the context of facing change in crisis and uh, reaching out to your target groups communicating with your uh, leadership and so on. So these are aspects that we will face today in the session too. Um, you can go to the next slide already, thanks. Because now I will be preparing you for the first presentation by the colleague from DRD, Beate Körner. Um, and as I mentioned, our central topic in dealing with Erasmus, uh, the Erasmus Plus program and the project management is the change management. This is one focus topic. And in this presentation by Beate, we will hopefully learn how to adapt uh, the work in the context of crisis. Uh, the DRD will be, well, set an example of how to proceed in this context, how they have uh, managed to adapt to the crisis and uh, adapt the project management, communication strategy. So we will learn a lot from Beate. Um, and we are all in the midst of this crisis. So we all had to adapt within this year. And um, not only ourselves, but of course in the work context too. And so um, the first step will be for you to answer some questions, to reflect yourself a bit on how you dealt with the crisis and with the changes this meant for your work context within this year, you will have to go to Mentimeter, so www.menti.com, and you can use the code, or you have to use the code, 8321766. And uh, we would ask you first uh, to reflect on the strategies yet that you have applied to adapt your internal procedures to the crisis situation of 2020. Because we will discuss this a lot, but I expect that during the last couple of months, you all had to adapt. You had to overthink your strategies, your procedures, uh, your communication. And so we would ask you for some feedback on how you dealt with the situation at hand in 2020. And we will give you a short moment. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are always hoping for a strategy, but especially in the context of crisis, it uh, is often, I think, a day-to-day -day business of just getting along um, I think we all have had this experience. Um, I can relate to most of the issues you're mentioning here, I think. And of course, digitalization uh, is popping up again and again. And it is a topic that we have been dealing with in Erasmus for quite some time now. And we are facing a digital uh, universe uh, within the next seven years. So we can see this a bit as a preparation and testing phase, but of course it would have been nice to have a bit more time to adapt and to select what we want to implement and how we want to proceed. Uh, but it's very helpful um, and we can recognize a pattern here, of course, and I think Beate will mention a number of issues that you have experienced as well. We, we could maybe stop this first. Uh, is there still a lot happening? If not, we have a second question for you. 
because here apparently you have adapted very well you have faced the challenges and you have uh, found ways to still continue with your work you have all i expect implemented uh, your mobility projects maybe under changed conditions with limited numbers or opportunities for mobility but if you could change uh, and go to the next question thank you so um, of course this relates very closely to the first question what barriers have you met while adapting your internal procedures to the crisis situation of 2020 so you all maybe had, didn't have a strategy it was all too soon and too sudden and uh, too intense to actually develop a proper strategy maybe but uh, you all have reacted to the situation and uh, now we would be interested what you perceived as the main barriers in dealing with the crisis and there might be some repetition from the first question, but still it's a bit of a different perspective on the issue. Yeah, lack of flexibility. Um, I think um, many, many um, universities, international offices, staff and students have shown a lot of flexibility, but I agree that the structures, the structures maybe of the programs, the structures of the administration, uh, regulations often lack the flexibility and don't, ask, don't adapt as quickly as necessary to crisis situations. Lack of information, personal interaction indeed, indeed it would have been very nice to be, have you all here in person uh, as well. Ever-changing regulations, um, an ever-changing situation, lack of flex, yeah. Um, and especially this continuous change during the year, uh, sometimes more intense, sometimes a bit more relaxed, but uh, never to be able to plan ahead for, in some phases, more than maybe a week or some days at a time, was indeed uh, a challenge that took not only time and uh, it took energy, it took, of course, a lot of staff resources. Um, yeah. And uh, indeed, uh, to remind you, in our last session of this training series, one topic will be stress management. So if you have survived 2020, then uh, I advise you to join us in the last session as well, because there we will maybe learn how to face 2021 uh, with this session. And uh, we have in the first session next year on the 21st of January, we have uh, the topic stress management. So uh, time management, sorry, time management. So again, uh, we selected the topics, of course, because they are so central to your daily work or our daily work and uh, how to adapt to changing conditions and implement projects with quality. Um, thank you so much for your feedback. And now I would introduce uh, Beate Kölner from DRD. Uh, she's head of the section Erasmus Plus Partnerships and Cooperation Projects in the, our German National Agency uh, for EU Higher Education Cooperation of the German Academic Exchange Service. Uh, she's been working there since 2009 and is in charge of the coordination and management of Erasmus Plus Strategic Partnerships in higher education and counseling and assistance of the German universities for all the centralized programs in Erasmus Plus. So uh, you all know the European universities, uh, capacity building projects, knowledge al alliances, joint master degrees, and the Jean Monnet. And she's in charge as well of the uh, Erasmus Meet School, Europa macht Schule program, uh, which is a very active program uh, in close cooperation with uh, schools uh, in the regions and with uh, students and pupils uh, within Germany. Um, and I would ask Beate, I give the floor to you to start your presentation on change and crisis management from the perspective of the national agency. Thank you very much. First of all, I need to activate my microphone. <laughs> And good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be here uh, in this um, training and um, even more so because, as Christina just said, uh, um, the, we, I'm responsible for, all, uh, amongst other things, for the um, strategic partnerships and this uh, project uh, uh, framework for Erasmus staff competencies is one of our projects that we are um, that we are financing, so to say, with, of course, Erasmus uh, funding. 
and uh, yes, uh, so I'm kind of pleased to also be involved uh, in, in such a project and I would like to present to you today um, our change management and the quality assurance uh, that we have done um, during our, yeah, during the past basically 10, 9, 10 months, I would say. And um, yes, um, let me just one second, I have to change something here. Um, one moment. Can you already see uh, the presentation? Yes, yes, we can see the full screen. Great. So now, one more second. See, even after 10 months of technology, uh, it's still um, taking some time, but now we're all set. All right, so um, I, I am sure um, many of you have heard about DAD, but uh, first of all, I would like to give you a little short introduction of who we are and what we're doing. And then, of course, um, it was actually a kind of interesting to, to get the invitation for, for uh, doing this because the reflection and looking back uh, on how did we start and where are we now, uh, even though we th most of us probably have the impression it was a crazy year, I think if you really break it down, then you can actually see how much uh, we have learned, how much competencies we have gained, uh, probably on a personal level, but also um, in our institutions. And of course, um, it's very important to not do that randomly, but have, uh, be properly organized. And uh, even if you, if you were not in the beginning, I'm sure now you are. And um, so I have uh, put down different steps here that I want, would like to address from crisis management to uh, leadership and strategy. Of course, quality assurance of all this is very important, uh, as well as time management, uh, communication. You already mentioned that in, in the Mentimeter. Uh, I, I would give you uh, one more example. And then, of course, uh, as always, the, we, have, we have faced a lot of challenges. But as I just said, I think these challenges also can be turned into chances. And I think that's uh, very good. So um, to start, the DAD is a um, organization, is probably the largest uh, yeah, funding organization uh, in, the, uh, in the world, I think. And uh, we are situated here in Bonn uh, with roughly 950 uh, colleagues. And then we have a Berlin office and we have uh, almost 70 branch offices worldwide. Uh, a lot of people think that we are a government organization, but we are not. We are actually a registered association. So the German higher education institutions, almost 250, are basically our uh, institution members, as well as uh, more than 100 student bodies from these universities. And uh, besides these branch offices and our, our headquarters, we also have uh, lectureships throughout the world, we have alumni association, we have German centers for research and innovation, and uh, we have interdisciplinary centers for German and European studies and so on and so forth. And um, so, of course, many of you know maybe uh, that we are giving out funding uh, to students and staff uh, throughout the world coming to Germany and uh, going out from Germany. So here you see some numbers. So last year we had almost 150,000 uh, students, graduate and researchers funded. And we have, um, since 1950, we have funded uh, uh, a little bit more than 1.5 million uh, in, uh, individuals uh, from Germany into the world and uh, more than a, a million individuals that ca came to Germany. And uh, I think, of course, we can only do that with uh, good budget. So at the moment, we have roughly 600 million euros annual budget. And um, yeah, we have uh, more than 33,000 students enrolled uh, in German transnational education uh, programs. And uh, I think uh, that should be enough for now. And uh, 
even though many people think we only give scholarships, but we do a lot more than that. We are involved in a lot of things. And here you can uh, see three overarching goals that we have at DAD uh, because, of course, uh, education and uh, science, um, international exchange is our uh, mo are our most important uh, things or are in, in the focus and we want to promote excellence and broaden perspectives, uh, especially also in these times, uh, science diplomacy, I am sure you've heard. And uh, with this, we want to also enhance the international collaboration, not only for the universities, but also uh, science in general, industry and, and the overall society, of course. And I think it's also important for us that we assume a global responsibility and uh, contribute to uh, good development and, and of course also peace. Uh, that's a very important thing. Um, I'm sure you know you know some of these people. So just to show you a few of our alumni, like Olga, Olga Tokarczuk, who is the Nobel laureate in literature 2018 from Poland. Uh, she was a DAD uh, uh, alumna. Then Michelle Bachelet from, um, she's the former president of Chile and currently the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Then our uh, astronaut uh, Alexander Gerst from Germany. And um, also, for example, an, a, a writer Mario Vargas Llosa uh, from Peru, who is also a Nobel laureate. And I think this is just to show you that um, we have alumni all through the world, which is also uh, very important uh, for us. Now, um, as Christina mentioned, uh, we're at the national agency, and I think at least the uh, uh, participants who are in European countries know what a national agency for Erasmus is, because um, we in, this exists in each country in, in uh, Europe or in the European uh, member states. And uh, we are responsible for the Erasmus implementation already for more than uh, 30 years. And we are not doing, uh, not only doing uh, Erasmus mobility, but especially also uh, projects. And uh, here you can see our little uh, organigram. And this is where I am situated. At. So we are really responsible for the partnerships and cooperation projects, as Christina said. And uh, yeah, she also mentioned the different actions that we're taking care of, so I will not go into detail there. Um, so in case you have any questions, uh, just you can follow us or contact me, of course. And without much further ado, I would like to tell you a little bit about how it all started. And of course, it started for all of us in the same way. I think last year, at the end of last year, we heard something about this new form of pneumonia in China, but we were all like, okay, well, this is in China. <laughs> then, however, um, it soon started to, to continue much faster than we wanted. And, um, but already when, uh, for us in DAD, we were already affected because of course we have uh, students in China, we have staff in China and people coming from there. So uh, already then we had to get, we had to be quick and gather information on the break of the, of the virus. We had to talk about the possibilities for safeguarding participants. Uh, this force majeure was introduced uh, in relation first uh, to, uh, to travel from and to China. And then, of course, uh, yeah, as you know, it went quite fast already in February. We, we said, OK, there are more concerned regions. So we had to issue travel warnings. Um, and then uh, in March, it continued very fast. I will not read all of this uh, to you uh, separately, but we had to make quick decisions. We had to, of course, also reassure ourselves and you and uh, especially our German universities that what we are doing is correct and this is a constant process. So and then I think all the way to June it took, um, as Christina said in the beginning, it went bam, 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 very quickly. Uh, but then we were roughly settled and of course now we still have to cope with it, but I think we are, we are doing much better now. And um, hold on, where did my ah, here. Um, I, I would like to uh, take a few things um, uh, because I'm sure all of you were also in the same situation. You got a lot of facts, you got a lot of information. 
But besides all these facts, we had these, these raised so many questions. We got all these questions sent by our higher education institutions. We had questions ourselves to the EU Commission, of course, who gives the money uh, for Erasmus. We had questions to our ministry. They had questions to us. So it is uh, a constant flow of information that you really need to coordinate. And as we all know, it is a, uh, was a very, very uh, dynamic process. So then uh, we had to sit down and luckily uh, at DAD, because we are operating anyway throughout the world, uh, we have already before we had a crisis manager. And uh, so we had, uh, we quickly set up a, a more extensive crisis management. I'm sure many of you did the same. And uh, so first of all, that was directed internally within DAD. So we had our crisis manager, then we set up a crisis committee and that was in, done in the entire DAD, but we did the same thing basically internally in our national agency, which is normal part of, of the DAD with our director, our heads of sections, team leaders, and so on and so forth, all the colleagues. And uh, then the same thing, of course, also externally. We had uh, with our government um, and the different ministries, we had constant uh, exchange, uh, other political stakeholders, uh, also, of course, the EU Commission and uh, our uh, crisis management with the universities. And um, yeah, as I said, we, we did have a crisis manager and we did have a, a risk management process, but of course, this needed to be improved because I think all of us, whatever crisis we had before was never to such an extent of what we had with, what we had or have with, uh, with COVID-19. So here we needed to improve that, refine these processes. We had to uh, coordinate different emergencies. I already mentioned uh, the, the travel uh, recalls, you know, um, people had to be taken back, students and staff, and, but this was, nothing we could do alone so it had to be done with the governments and um, so in a way you had to establish routines uh, first there were uh, very fat uh, very um, yeah uh, daily basically there were a lot but then when it became better than what was a weekly routine or even monthly you know we had meetings you you uh, got all these documents you got a lot of we got a lot of notes from the european commission and of course we had to process these and i will talk about this a little bit later and um, yeah, so we had to restructure ourselves. We had to restructure the normal tasks we do. Um, we had, and that I think is something that we really, uh, all of us probably struggled with. We had to secure our operation. Uh, we have, we needed sufficient technology. And I think uh, here we were really lucky because uh, we had, of course we had used some of these uh, MS Teams or Skype uh, for meetings before, but not on a, uh, a basis that was as it is now. And of course, uh, also with the computers, DAD was um, never really shut down completely in terms that people couldn't come here at all. But of course, uh, we had to develop the, the hygiene concepts so people were not allowed to be more than one person in a room and so on and so forth. So very quickly, we all got uh, laptops before a lot of people had still stationary computers so software hardware had to be adapted and now like all 950 people have their own laptops with docking stations where they can work from home and so on and so forth but without this you can't really you can forget everything else nowadays you know you really need uh, to secure your operations and your the needs that you have and you need the technology for that so yes so we set up this crisis management and um, along with this of course comes the term and uh, you said it in the mentimeter strategy some said what strategy <laughs> but really uh, of course uh, there is a leadership and you have to come up with a strategy i think is very important and that's what we did and uh, we also had to ask ourselves okay uh, who are we because our self-perception and our mission is normally that we are an intermediary uh, as a national agency with, uh, we have a contract from the European Commission to do Erasmus 
uh, and also with our national ministry. But at the same time, we are uh, an agent for our German higher education institutions. So we are in the middle of things and uh, we, wa we, we want to have a good service to our higher education institutions. But of course, we also need to fulfill the regulations. So we really needed to sit down and say, okay, what do we do? Do we only react? We got messages and documents and info notes from the commission. And do we just react and give them to our uh, higher education institutions? But no, we, we took a decision that we want to act. We want to be on the forefront. We want to guide our highs and uh, let me tell you that was really difficult because it really required a huge amount of capacities, personal capacities, time, of course. And of course, you needed all this information and it came every day, another information as some of you mentioned in, in the Mentimeter. And uh, so if you, if you uh, decide on that, you really need to go an extra mile to, to have the concept ready and, and develop it current constantly and be basically really on top so that you can not only say, well, the commission told us to do this and this, so that's what we tell you. No, we wanted to give good information to our institutions to tell them, okay, let me see what are your problems. Let me see how we can uh, do this at the same time respecting the regulations. So this, is, this was our strategy. On the other hand, of course, we also had to have a mot motivation strategy for our own uh, colleagues because uh, like everybody else, we were all like, oh, what's going on? And this was so much work, you know? Um, so people needed to keep, uh, needed to stay uh, motivated. Um, and I think it's important also, I know, I'm sure you know some people in the leadership and probably also in your university say, uh, well, home office or mobile work, uh, well, people don't work. But this is something that's, of course, not true. And I think all with these uh, maybe overcome pictures of work, uh, you need to build trust and understanding also for the uh, uh, needs of the people because of course if you, you you are a worker but at the same time you have children you have family that you need to take care of in this crisis so I think this motivation strategy was also something uh, very important for us then uh, at the um, uh, at the same level as we need good uh, uh, leadership and a good strategy you also of course uh, still <laughs> even though we wish uh, it wasn't always the case because it's also sometimes uh, bureaucratic, but you need to have a good quality assurance to be able to function also uh, on the long run. Um, so of course we have uh, processes uh, we have, uh, for um, since 2006, uh, our national agency is um, quality, uh, it has a quality management and um, we have, uh, of course, these processes that we follow normal, but of course, in such a crisis, you have to adapt. You have to change uh, deadlines. You have to accustom everything. And um, as I said, we had all these documents, these notes uh, from which we created FAQs for our institutions and guidelines. Uh, you have to put all, on, uh, all of this on the website and um, so that people can reach you, of course, also by telephone or email. But I think the more you have prepared to put on the website and have ready, uh, the less you will be consulted by, by phone or by, by email. Um, yeah, I, I already said about the technology, that was one thing to have the hardware, but then again, uh, also to be able to communicate well, uh, and I think this is even more so for you in the universities, uh, you had to transfer all your events, meetings, and so on and so forth into a digital format, which of course also took time and uh, I think also a lot of pains. For us, it was also how we, how we can um, transfer the project activities and mo mobility activities. Um, is this possible, you know? And so this was um, also something that we had, all of the national agencies in Europe decided with the EU Commission that, for example, you accept that the students uh, finish their uh, uh, mobility activities 
uh, online and at home and so on and so forth. The same with project activities like an, an event like yours, which would probably have been done um, on a face face to face basis had to now cha uh, be changed into uh, mobi uh, mobility, uh, sorry, a virtual activity and um, then do you still get money for that? All these questions, uh, legal issues. When does force majeure kick in? Uh, does it have to be a case by case decision for each university or can we do this on a bigger picture? We had to extend our contracts with the universities. We had to assure data protection. How do we cope with signatures? You know, all this bureaucratic stuff we have to do. <laughs> you had to somehow adapt to the technology issues. And uh, of course, communication uh, with the project coordinators, it had to be fast. You know, you cannot let them wait for a week or three days. You have to give, if it's necessary, give them something every day. It needs to be precise and it needs, or you need to be ready to adapt this on a, on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, what, whatever is necessary. So this is quality assurance for us. And I think uh, we did quite well. And of course, I mean, still there, there were uncertainties. We all, all of us did not have this uh, crystal ball, which we could look into. Uh, and we, we didn't know uh, what's going on, but I think uh, as I said, we managed quite well. So I just uh, mentioned uh, time. And I think, uh, of course, there are three components to this. And uh, I think I don't need to, con uh, to go into too much detail about the um, short term time management. Uh, this is just really to keep the business uh, continuity on a day to day basis. Um, but then I think you need to set your milestones also with like a medium uh, horizon, so to say. You, you need to establish uh, reliable routines for the people in your institution, but of course, in our case, more so for the people um, in the universities, uh, reliable and predictable. And of course also, and I think this is where we are now, you need to look at the long-term implications because uh, even though now we have all learned to cope uh, with the crisis with COVID and um, of course all of you in the international offices are still affected and we are too because uh, mobility is our daily business and now students are either at home or they're doing it virtually and so uh, I think we need to look at this from two levels and if you do that I think you can also um, develop new strategies uh, for the future because uh, one is you need to look at it from the management level. In our case, for example, we have projects um, and contracts that run up to three years, depending on what, on what it is. And um, of course, now you need uh, to extend them and we need to convey, uh, we need to respect the regulations from the commission. How long can we ex extend them? Uh, we need to change the, those processes. We need to think of audits. Like for example, if, if we say, okay, now um, we have this node, we have that node, uh, let's do it that way. But uh, in three years, in five years, we might get an audit from whoever. And I think it's very important to already now think of the good documentation that you know, okay, uh, we made three years ago, we made that decision because we had note one, two, three, or FAQs, five, six, seven, and so on and so forth. So we do still do and did a very detailed documentation of all these things that we got uh, for, for regulation purposes. And I think this is good to continue that on the long run because in five years, nobody knows exactly <laughs> anymore how it all came about. And of course also, um, long-term implications are on the program level or political level, because we can see that there is a reputation risk uh, for, for Erasmus in general, for the mobility, for the projects. Like if the European Commission had said, okay, we stop this and we continue uh, when, when it's all over, of course, that would be a dis uh, disaster, you know? So you need to take what you have 
and you need to continue even, uh, for example, to do projects virtually, to have mobility um, as blended mobilities, or you start virtually and continue later on physically. So I think these are all things that you need to keep in mind. And this is what we do. And uh, yeah, we hope it works. Of course, uh, I, right now we feel well prepared, but I think it will be an ongoing process. And uh, I think I have to come to an end time-wise. Um, communication strategies, I think, uh, of course, this is something that all of you do and did. Uh, you ne just need to be aware that you have all these different channels. In our case, of course, uh, internally with colleagues, with all the units, sections, and so on and so forth. Uh, with our externally then, with the media, with projects uh, or higher education institutions and um, also, of course, with the, with the people that fund us, that's very important. And uh, so I think if you set up a strategy for communication, you need to uh, involve all these different levels. And um, so, yeah, you need to kind of coordinate your information. You know, you cannot let it go out just like hmm, today this, tomorrow that. It needs to be well coordinated and uh, you need to be flexible and fast. Yes, and uh, the last example, or one example uh, I would like to give you where we had an extra uh, challenge, so to say. Um, I'm, maybe you've heard of it that there was, uh, due to the corona pandemic, there, there was a special call for strategic partnerships that came in the summer. And uh, the deadline was, I think, the uh, 29th of October. So it was called Digital Education Readiness. And um, Hold on. Uh, so um, now we have this, we got extra money from the commission to do an extra program. But of course, to do an extra program, you need to, first of all, yes, it's still a time of crisis and we need to make it a success. So this is really a challenge that comes on a very short notice. We need to prepare such an extra program because we don't have we don't have like extra three people to do that. So we you need to do this with the personnel that you have, but uh, you need to prepare it well on a strategic and management level. And uh, then we have to of course see how can we cope uh, with the capacities we have, you know, make a milestone planning time wise, and of course the money we have. We need to do proper marketing and so on and so forth. So when we heard about this, of course, it's great to hear, okay, there are an, an extra 100 million euros for all European countries to have this program, digital education readiness. But yeah, it's great, but you need to do this. And uh, I think, um, yeah, we started, we set ourselves, put ourselves together, thought it all out, and now it started and we will see how it goes. Um, We've, we've gotten a lot of applications, which makes it even more difficult, but uh, I think we will cope nicely. And uh, so we see in the, in the summer or in the spring, rather, they will start with these projects and we hope it will turn out very well. And I'm sure maybe some of you faced such a situation too, that you got some extra work from your, from your um, board of directors at the university or from your governments or ministries or whatever that you had to cope with. So um, for, for this uh, special program, we ran all these, what I just gave you, uh, this entire change management or quality assurance issues through this program and we hope we are well prepared. Yes, so what did we learn from all that? Um, yeah, eventually, <laughs> I think this is what we all know, no matter where we are and uh, uh, where we work, somehow at the end, it all works out. Uh, of course, good procedures and good documentation will help you from the beginning and also on the long run. Uh, I think we all uh, strengthened our resilience uh, in, the, in times of crisis and our flexibility, I'm sure. And uh, <laughs> for me, <laughs> I think a lot of my colleagues, our digital skills soared through the roof. Of course, uh, I think it depends to uh, the generation you're, um, you, you belong to. I'm sure people early 20s, uh, early 30s, they are like, you know, they are digital uh, natives anyway, and we are, 
I feel more like a digital immigrant, but I feel much better prepared now than 10 months ago. Um, and of course, uh, I think, although we can surely say that we miss personal contact in a lot of ways, I think there are some positive aspects that this crisis taught us that we could use and also re that can remain after the crisis. Because uh, alone looking at more than 200 participants in this um, uh, seminar, I don't know if all of you would have come actually personally, but it's something else if you can tune in to an event for two hours, three hours, whatever. Um, so in this in this sense, you, you kind of can save money and also save um, uh, resources, you know, be, be more sustainable in terms of this, um, not to travel all the time. But of course, we would like to continue with the mobilities, with the project also uh, personally. And um, because the experience in another country, I think this is something that you can never experience uh, online. Yes, uh, and I think that's all there is. And uh, I have uh, some questions, but I think um, these are for the discussion round and I think they will be done, uh, Christina, um, maybe we will do them in the Mentimeter, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, we will switch to Mentimeter and ask you all to um, feedback on the questions. But first of all, thank you very much, Beate, for the presentation. And I think it was really helpful uh, for us from the higher education institutions as well to on the one hand, to see that you're about in the same position as intermediate between different uh, institutions, different levels of communication, and have to cater for such a variety of needs and challenges. And uh, some of the core terms that you mentioned, I just want to repeat them a bit while the colleagues have uh, the time to uh, answer and comment in the Mentimeter. Uh, so what Beate said as well, what did COVID-19 teach you that you would not have expected? And what will you keep after the pandemic? So uh, we always already mentioned uh, some of the aspects that could be uh, useful and that could be worth following up on keeping in the programs. But of course, some elements you might be glad to be rid of as well. Um, and uh, I think what you mentioned, what's directly related to our daily work and uh, at the institutions as well as the aspect of quality assurance, regardless of the context, of course, we still have to implement and successfully implement the projects. We have to cater for our target groups. We cannot just leave the students out of the picture just because we are under stress, under pressure, where we don't know how to cope. So we still have to continue our work um, that requires strategies, um, even if it's strategies that have to adapt again and that uh, have to maybe be rethought again. But still, you have to follow up and you cannot recreate the program every day anew. So you do need a strategy that's following up uh, and in ensures the quality um, of the implementation. Uh, so the management aspects of the projects that you mentioned, um, the soft skills you mentioned as well, and that we got from the Mentimeter earlier on too, like this uh, time management, uh, defining milestones to implement the project. And of course, communication and the digital skills that pop up here as well. And um, I think having rethought cooperation um, and communication in the context of the pandemic is indeed something that will remain. So um, if we think of uh, the sustainability aspect of the new Erasmus program, the green Erasmus, if we can reduce travel uh, and still have close cooperation, uh, continuous communication with our partners, with our students, um, this is something worthwhile uh, keeping into the program. But at the same time, I think all of us agree that we still need physical mobility to have proper, uh, a broad experience for students anyway, for staff, I think as well. But of course we can adapt and change the formats. And I think there's some really interesting feedback you give here. And uh, I think we all have a number of lessons learned from the last year. Um, perfect, so we will have all your feedback in the documentation as well. We try to save it. Uh, so we will have the opportunity to comment on this in more detail and you can reflect some more Exactly, because what we would need now is a second question. 
uh, what are the most urgent challenges that need to be tackled at your institution regarding the topics of change man management and quality assurance. So what we mentioned uh, now Beate, in our presentation and in our comments, um, just some thoughts on this aspect of uh, the challenges. What do we still have to do to adapt uh, to the uh, change management and how to ensure quality in this context? So if you can uh, give uh, a few comments on this as well. And again, as uh, in the first round of questions, of course, there are some repetitions where there's chances, there's challenges as well, of course, uh, in the context of change, it's always a challenge, but at the same time, it's something that's relevant to follow up on. Fantastic. So again, digitalization and communication, I think we can't get around that. Uh, transparent communication uh, among administrative areas. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. And I think we all noticed that internal communication as well, uh, in some phases tended to be a bit uh, conflict laden sometimes because there were, were a lot of conflicting in interests, maybe priorities that had to be redefined. Training teaching staff and institutional staff on digital formats. Yes, the uh, requirement of new forms and new uh, maybe offers of training opportunities, preparing staff for the new requirements is definitely one aspect. We would have to close the uh, questions now, I think, because we uh, want to turn to the next presentation. Um, because again, on the to uh, topic of change, uh, we have a second presentation today from Frederick de Decker from University of Ghent. Uh, who is head of international relations office at the University of Ghent and uh, has actually working in the context of internationalization for many years and is now working at his alma mater. Uh, so uh, very continuous uh, uh, biography in this respect. Um, and uh, he has, uh, he's participates regularly as an expert in international projects and uh, as an advisor in different um, groups as well on internationalization, educational development and qualification frameworks. So he's an expert in the field um, and we are very happy to have him here today to present uh, on change management. Now, not so much focusing on the crisis we are uh, facing at the moment, but more on the future of Erasmus. And I would give the floor to you, Frederick, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you very much, Christina, for your kind words of introduction and uh, a very warm welcome also on my behalf to this uh, broad audience. And I'm very happy to see that so many colleagues took the time to further dive into the importance of change management in international relations and, and more specifically in an international relations office. We are quite uh, a lot of people and so um, with, as I said, say, the start of this um, introduction, I would like to hear from you what category of staff describes your role in, in the university best? Are you working mainly at faculty level? At, uh, at central level, are you uh, in the administration or are you uh, a teacher within your uh, institution or does none of these fit where you are? So if you go to menti.com and fill in the code there, so not the code of the previous presentation, but uh, there's another code now that's 311153. Um, then we uh, get a bit of a input on where you are situated in your uh, organization. Um, I, I'm myself the head of the IRO at Ghent University, as Christina said, and uh, I've been involved in this FESC project together with my colleague Anne van Laak, and, and we are very happy to also contribute to, to this training. And I see that many of you uh, are actually also colleagues at a central level, and a few, um, uh, and, 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 and many others also at the faculty or another decentral level within your institution. Um, and a few of you are uh, teachers at the university or are taking an other function. Okay, that gives us a very good idea already, I think, of who is in the audience. I, I'm sure that not everybody got the time to fill this out, but uh, at least we know uh, more or less of a large proportion of the participants where they are situated. So I, pr I propose to go to the um, second part, uh, part of this introduction. Um, 
two issues there. You can use a slider whether uh, you are uh, working in internationalization full time or, uh, or uh, so if it's zero percent, it, it, oh, well, you can move to 10 percent, for instance, and move it to the right if you are fully employed in internationalizations. And you can also uh, describe uh, what number of years of experience you have, whether that is uh, in between, let's say, uh, if it's one, and, and if it's more than 20, you can move it to the full right there, so that we know um, what the level of experience of the people are, is. And I, uh, I see that many of you are working the uh, largest proportion of their time in internationalization and uh, the, 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 in terms of experience. Uh, there is also uh, more or less in the middle, let's say, that. Uh, if we if we uh, take it from this graph, uh, many of you have more than ten years' experience already in in internationalization. Uh, I started myself, and, and that's already a link to the next slide. In 1994, in uh, working in the uh, IRO of Ghent University, and um, as you will see from this slide, since that time, many has changed in. Uh, the, the the setup of the layout of, of our international relations office uh, because it, it more or less follows the flow of the Erasmus plus pro or, or previous Erasmus program and so uh, we started as an office for European educational projects in 87 at the university and then we moved from this specific focus on Erasmus more and more to broader a focus uh, with the creation in 95 of an international relations office but also with the start of faculty committees for internationalization which play a very important role in our day-to-day uh, -day internationalization management uh, within uh, the uh, uh, department for educational policy in which we as IRO are embedded and the reason why I uh, show this is that uh, all these changes in, uh, for instance, the Erasmus program, but also uh, at the broader level, if you refer to 1999 with the start of the Bologna process, this has all had a huge impact on the way in which we are organized and the way in which we deal with things, in, in which we uh, take care of different uh, internationalization elements within the university. And so change, as you can see from, the, from this short history of, of our own IRO, change is always there when we look at international relations. And so it is very important that we as international relations officers are able to deal with that change. And um, uh, as Christina said in her introduction, as, a, as an example of, of possible changes to anticipate with the start of the new Erasmus Plus program, I would like to look uh, at inclusive mobility. So what we will do is that um, I will uh, first give you some input on different uh, ways of preparing for, for such change and then we will apply this to um, the challenge of uh, making our mobility within the universities more inclusive. But I want to start us off by stressing the importance of vision making in whatever change process is ahead. Um, so if, you, if we apply this to inclusive mobility we need to find the answer to the question why do we want a more diverse group of students to be uh, to become to be international uh, internationally mobile and so um, inclusion is really key there uh, vision uh, making is in, in, uh, really key there so let's try to open our minds for this vision if we pose this question to you why do you want a more diverse group of students to be internationally mobile Take, take a few seconds to, to, to consider this and to give us some ideas about, uh, to, uh, about this why question, because I think this is something we do not often enough do in internationalization, that is uh, taking time to uh, answer the why question. And so vision development starts with this why question and we get some already some very nice uh, ideas uh, that colleagues share about why it is important that we have a more diverse group of students to be internationally mobile, to offer more equal opportunities, or so very broad and, and very important aims such as uh, world peace, equity, or equality, uh, provide equal opportunities to enhance intercultural uh, skills and competences of uh, our students. Um, 
and, and indeed diversity is a richness. I think that's a very important element to take into account and, and to value this. Uh, and, uh, also external drivers, and we will come back to that later, uh, ministerial um, internationalization indicators or uh, certain um, benchmarks that are uh, imposed on, on us can play a very important role in that. And so this, uh, I see that some colleagues see this as a kind of next step of progress in internationalization processes. And I think that's also very, these are also very important drivers. So we will, uh, by the way, keep all these answers you give and share these with you afterwards that you can also take these on board when you're doing these kind of exercises within your own institution as well in, in, in a couple of weeks or months when we, when the new Erasmus Plus program is launched and we will need to answer uh, questions such as this one. So thank you very much for uh, these uh, very interesting contributions uh, to this to this issue of why we want a more diverse group of students to be internationally mobile. And so it all starts, as I said, with answering this why question. Um, and and it, it creates a momentum. It's a kind of official kickoff uh, for an important change that is uh, about to, to happen within uh, the environment that we work in. It sets the scene, but it also ensures commitment and ownership of all stakeholders because uh, developing a vision is not something that you do on your own, but it is something that you do together with many um, stakeholders. And, and, and at such a, division, a vision development uh, exercise. You, you uh, focus on the why, but that means that you also need to discuss uh, which elements you would include in your vision, which, stakeholder, which, which stakeholders you, you need to involve, and how you would set up the process of writing uh, that vision. And so, um, what, if we take one example of, of this question, as I said, it is not something that you should do on your own. So I would like to hear from you uh, which stakeholders, if we take again the, the, the vision development on inclusive mobility, would you involve in such a process? Who in your university uh, would you involve? And of course, it's very, I think it's very straightforward and it's very good that the first answers refer to students and students associations such as ESN as well because they it, it is for them that we uh, are developing such a vision on inclusive mobility and it's uh, definitely important to also include these like many other stakeholders professors people from the management but also non-IRO uh, staff in the university like the people from social services uh, uh, student counselors and so on. So very uh, interesting suggestions here on who to involve involve in such a division in such a vision development on inclusive mobility. Um, also, persons in charge of designing curriculum uh, uh, and definitely the disability center or disability officers within your uh, institution. Uh, that, that's something that comes out of many projects focusing on inclusive mobility, that it's, it's important to closely work together there between uh, the people of the IRO and people of the disability centers. So thank you very much for all these interesting suggestions here on whom to involve in this uh, division uh, development on inclusive mobility. Let me then present you a number of uh, instruments to support uh, persons working in an IRO in defining the state of affairs. There, there are many different methodologies. I will develop a few of these, SWOT analysis, stakeholder group analysis, past analysis, also uh, critical success fa factors and theory of change. And then we will end uh, with one. Uh, I will skip that question because we are uh, r running behind a little bit. Uh, I, I suppose you all know uh, a SWOT analysis, but it remains a very good tool to deal with change in your organization. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting way of uh, analyzing uh, such a challenge, such a change that is ahead. And it, it, it's also interesting because uh, based on this uh, SWOT analysis, you can uh, really define 
which uh, things you need to continue, uh, where are the goals, which things you need to defend, uh, so what are the threats we need to defend our university against, uh, the, the, the opportunities in which you need to invest, and the vulnerabilities that you have, uh, if, if you, uh, the weaknesses that you, uh, that fo force you to change your policy. So a SWOT analysis focusing on the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats with regard to a specific topic is a first uh, way of addressing such a topic. Uh, th these are a few uh, examples that that are not particularly focused per se on uh, on on um, the uh, case of inclusive mobility because we are going to do that later uh, during the session. But um, it gives you an idea of examples of strengths and, and weaknesses, which are mainly internal factors, which are dealing with what is the situation within my university, whereas the uh, opportunities and threats are more external factors, are more related to the outside world, uh, to things that as an institution, as an IRO, you do not have impact on. For instance, the increasing number of students and staff or uh, decreasing external funding possibilities, for instance. So SWOT analysis is a first way of addressing such an issue. A second approach I want to share with you is so-called stakeholder group analysis. Uh, again, there, um, the defining the right stakeholders is, of course, uh, crucial. And, uh, and uh, entering a debate with these stakeholders, which can be uh, internal stakeholders, but which, which can also be external stakeholders, can offer us a lot of uh, input in, in such a, uh, an exercise of developing a vision on a certain topic. And, there, and uh, many of the, the, the examples have been named uh, by yourself when I asked for, for some input there. But don't forget about also these external stakeholders, these, um, uh, for instance, uh, local authorities or local um, organizations or corporate partners uh, that can help you in uh, defining the real needs there. So um, this is a, another approach which can uh, really be very uh, helpful. A third one uh, I want to uh, look into are is the, or is the uh, defining of critical success factors. You can use these for both developing a strategic plan or strategic goal, but also, and I think that's also very important and interesting, defining the conditions to achieve the envisaged goals. So the, uh, the do not only look at uh, what do we want to achieve, but also what do what uh, conditions do we need to put in place in order to be able to achieve these envisaged goals. And um, if you define critical success factors, it's always helpful if you start by uh, using a kind of common statement there, like it is absolutely necessary that, or it has to be the case that, or something like that, that makes it very clear that if this or these conditions are not met, if these critical success factors are not um, apply to that, that uh, it, it'll, it'll be very difficult to make the change that you envis envisage. For instance, uh, if you think, for, as far as internationalization is concerned, that it is very high on the policy agenda of your institution, you could say that a critical success factor for that is that it is absolutely necessary that internationalization is embedded in the institutional policy or that planning of internationalization activities has to be included in the regular institutional planning activities, for instance. So these are examples of um, ways in which you can describe what has to be in place in order to be, to be able to make the change. And finally, before we uh, are going to the, the, the last uh, tool which we are going to apply in practice, because after all, this is a, a workshop, is um, a tool that was developed by, by Nuffik, which is the Dutch, uh, who are the Dutch colleagues of the DAD, so the uh, Dutch, uh, among other things, Erasmus Plus National Agency. They have developed this impact tool, which I think is uh, very interesting to apply to Erasmus plus projects, for instance, but also to other changes or uh, that you want to put in place. Uh, and it starts at the top right corner of the scheme uh, with, the, with the question uh, to very well define what fundamental change you want to contribute to. So what is it that we 
want to change. For instance, we want more students from a diverse background to be able to be internationally mobile. And then you look at how can we, what is our, your project, so to say, so the, the, the thing you want to put in place, how can it contribute to that change? So that's the, the second step. And then the third one is that you very well define um, what results are needed. And, and they, they give some examples of uh, concrete results. Uh, we want more trained students, for instance. And, and uh, that, so we, we want that percentage, that percentage of our students with disabilities to be able to study abroad. Or we want that percentage or that specific group of students also to be stimulated to study abroad. And the, the, the fourth step to, to take there is, which actions do you have to take? So then you really um, go towards the level of different steps you need to take. Uh, for instance, we need a targeted communication to the uh, to the, the groups, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, let's say the, the disadvantaged groups of students that to, that we want to be become more mobile. And then finally, what are your resources? And that's very much related, of course, also to uh, these critical success factors, because if you want to put something in place, you need the necessary resources there. And so uh, very straightforward examples of these are, of course, time, money, and staff. And um, so the, 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 if you go through this cir uh, cycle, because that the, the last one brings you back to the first one, because then uh, you, you, you need to be able to control things and see what uh, do we have under direct influence? What, what are the factors that we can influence ourselves and which ones are not? And, and, uh, and do we have to uh, take into account? That's uh, the very important to, to make that loop and, and to make this turn around um, uh, this week. So that's uh, the fourth tool I wanted to share with you. And the last one is the so-called PEST analysis or PEST alert. I will come back to that later, where um, you look at uh, the change ahead uh, from different uh, angles, from different point of view. So the, the, the changing factors in the broader environment in which you, as a university, as an IRO, are uh, active. Um, play an important role in, in, in such an uh, um, analysis. I think it's one of the best tools to use in such circumstances because um, it, it gives you the broadest picture uh, possible. Um, and it, it also allows you to bring the potential risk and possibilities to the daylight well in advance and take them into account in further developing your vision and, and uh, the way in which you want to put the change into practice. So the original model was called PEST, uh, with a, uh, I'll go one slide back, with a focus on political factors, economical factors, social, social and sociological factors and technological factors. Later on, three elements were added, which are environmental, legal and ethical. And you see on the next slide some general examples of these different uh, environmental factors like the political, economical, and so on. And what I want to do with you with the, in the remaining uh, time that we have for this workshop is apply this, uh, these different ones to the case that I put forward, uh, which is uh, the increase uh, of inclusive mobility and under the next Erasmus Plus program. So this issue of we want more students from a diverse background to become mobile. So if we first look at the political factors, which ones do you think um, would you like to uh, take into account uh, while you are putting this into uh, practice? And, I, my, uh, and you can go again to the, um, to the Menti 311153 and share some examples. And I will do that as well to kick it off if my computer... Okay, so for instance, the first one um, for the political could be the uh, increased nationalism or increased Eurocentrism, um, uh, which is a, a political factor that we have to take into account if we're talking about increasing um, increasing inclusive mobility. So I see some other 
elements that are added. different ones, political instability, democracy, uh, apply for student visa, uh, definitely an important one as well, visa restrictions, um, the, uh, racism, increased racism, but that's a political factor or a social, sociological, that's a different discussion, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, it, it is the aim of the exercise is to map the different elements that play a role or could play a role in 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 uh, this vision making regarding inclusive mobility and and the change that will bring uh, and that very good examples like poverty terrorism uh, the border policies that that really uh, put the fingers on some of the challenges that uh, lie ahead of us and that we need to take into account when um, putting a policy with regard to inclusive mobility into practice. So thank you very much for these interesting examples. Um, so that's the, these are some political factors. And as I said, um, we will share these uh, with you and you can uh, use these of course later on in, in your own exercise as well. The second, um, one that we want to look at are the economical factors with regard to inclusive mobility. So uh, again there, um, I, I will share one with you. And that is very clear that uh, in more inclusive mobility um, will lead to uh, more costs and uh, that we need to take that into account. Adapted scholarships, uh, people with low income, so financial uh, elements definitely play a role there as we can see for many of the examples that are put on the screen right now. And you, you see that the more a certain word is entered here, the more uh, it appears on the screen and the, uh, the more uh, the larger uh, font it gets. And so scholarships definitely play a role there. And I'm happy that uh, the first information we get there from uh, the European Commission on the new Erasmus Plus program indicates to uh, extra funding possibilities uh, to increase this inclusive mobility. So I'm, I'm very happy to see this happening. And I'm uh, sure you are too. Uh, I see also uh, that diversity in national schemes play an important role. Um, initial under uh, financing, uh, people with low incomes, of course, uh, will will have less access or could la have less access if there are no specific measures put in place. So very interesting suggestions here with regard to the economical factors but the uh, by far the most important one has to do with uh, scholarships or grants there okay let's have a look at the um, uh, social or sociological um, factors here uh, which ones do you think play a role in that um, again here Feel free to give you to give uh, your ideas. Discrimination, individualism, racism, also here poverty uh, pops up, uh, the intercultural differences, or if you look at it from the other side, the, the growing multiculturalism. Um, indeed, the increasingly uh, diverse population is, plays a very important role there, um, but also the, the back set of that. So these are uh, very interesting uh, social and sociological factors that we have to take into account when we want to increase the uh, mobility of uh, students from diverse backgrounds. Um, 
lack of information is, I think, definitely a very important one. Communication information to these specific target groups play a very important role, as well as the uh, social background or the family background, and, and the play, the, we should not underestimate the role that um, parents or other uh, persons next of kin play in uh, this decision-making processes. So very interesting uh, to read your answers here. And let's um, move on to the uh, fourth one, which is the, uh, which are the technological factors uh, and how uh, these can uh, affect um, inclusive mobility because uh, in, in there is definitely uh, a big link there between online mobility uh, as a first step towards physical mobility for instance uh, and, and and so the uh, digital digital the need for digital skills in order to be able to uh, participate in that type of mobility definitely plays a very important role and you see that popping up quite a lot of times with this lack of IT tools, but also lack of digital skills and access to technology or internet uh, in general. Um, that's, I think, because we all perceive online mobility as this step uh, towards physical mobility. And of course, if we want to use that, uh, uh, and, and then we hear the first uh, ideas coming up about the new Erasmus Plus program with its importance for short-term blended mobility. Indeed, uh, internet access and digital skills will play a crucial role in that. And, and that's also one of the reasons why in FASC we have attached such a great deal of importance to, to these digital skills for people uh, involved in internationalization. And then the final um, one for which I would like to have some input and I already took into account that we were be, would, would uh, lack sufficient time to go in detail for all of these. So I've taken the last ones, environmental, legal, ethical together. I know it's quite a different, uh, these are quite some different things, but uh, 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 all ideas you have with regard to that. Uh, and uh, I think, for instance, environmental, uh, I was just talking about these ideas of more short term time uh, mobility, more short time mobility will have, of course, uh, impact on the environment um, and uh, elements uh, with regard to the LGBTQ students are definitely very uh, ethical factors, very, very clear ethical factors. Um, and, and indeed, even more flying could be the result of this focus on uh, yeah, more students, more uh, groups of students, but also for shorter periods abroad. Um, and that's, these are definitely elements that we need to take into account while we are developing a policy with regard to uh, increasing uh, mobility for these uh, students from diverse backgrounds. So um, all very interesting ideas. And I said you, uh, as I said, the, the uh, presentation including all your suggestions will be made available later on. So you will have these to use during your own exercise and taking time into account. I will come to a close. Um, this has been, this is the building uh, of the uh, central administration uh, the, with regard to education at Kent University. And uh, this has been a slogan written on the wall for quite a, a while. The next big thing will be a lot of small things. I, I like this slogan very much because it shows that also we as individuals and with our small ideas and, and what we've just done, if we bring them together, we already uh, find quite some input with regard to vision development and with regard to change management. And I hope this uh, exercise uh, might have inspired you to, to do this, um, not only uh, for now, uh, but also when indeed the new Erasmus Plus program will start and we will have to put these uh, more inclusive mobility schemes into action. So thank you very much for your attention and for your very active contribution that's very much appreciated and I give back the floor to Victoria and Christina now. Thank you very much Frederick for your presentation and indeed a very ac active participation by all of you uh, which is for us of course helpful indeed 
and um, you will find all the presentations, all the information on our website um, to go back to this and go into more detail. Uh, we are actually already at the end of the session um, because 90 minutes is not as much as you might think uh, in preparing such a session. Um, before we leave you to uh, the rest of the year and the holidays, first of all, I want to thank again Beate and Frederik for your presentations and your really helpful insights into the topic of change management uh, in different contexts and from different perspectives, but with all the parallels, uh, parallels that we can see uh, apply to the topic. Um, here again for all of you, the summary of uh, or the program for the next sessions, uh, just to remind you that we will continue our program uh, next year. Um, so on the 21st of January, we have the next session, uh, reaching out how to communicate and perform effectively at work. Uh, and there, for example, we will deal with the topic of um, time management um, and um, we notice today how relevant it is and we try to keep our time as well uh, to set a good example. That's why we rush a bit to the end. And then on the 28th of um, January, we have the getting on career development and soft skills. And I mentioned earlier that we will um, have their uh, presentation on stress management. We will talk uh, about digital skills, which popped up again and again during this session. So we know how central this is. And in the end, we will give you some, uh, some guidelines on how to apply all of this in your daily work, how to apply the framework and include it into your work context, because it's a lot of information. We notice on how many levels uh, all these competences are required and how flexible you have to be to adapt to the, um, the frameworks that you're working in. So we will try to help you along in this way. And for now, I, Thank all of you for participating in this meeting. Uh, Victoria, thank you again for uh, organizing this and uh, securing our, um, the stability of this uh, whole meeting uh, because I try to be more digitally adept, but I'm still in the process of learning as well. So um, we wish you great holidays and hopefully a bit of rest and uh, time for yourself um, to prepare for uh, the next year. And we see you again um, in a few weeks. Thank you again and um, have a good day. Thank you Bye. as well and happy holidays, everyone. Bye-bye.